Welcome to the Open Hearted Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Open Hearted Podcast. I'm your host, Will Wheeler, joined with my main man, Photon John. What's going on, brother? I am very refreshed, just back from a weekend on a, a bunch of islands, so I'm feeling pretty good. Nice, How about man. Oh, actually, when I, you know, it's funny, right? I Sometimes, as you get older, you ask people, oh, what'd you get up to on the weekend? And it's like, oh, geez, I, I don't know. You know yeah. what I mean? It just it just becomes one weekend after the other, right? Yeah, and, yeah. It um, work. Yeah, but I actually did go out on the weekend. I caught up with a mm. friend of mine. We went out for some dinner on Friday night. Cool. I had a few wines. Um, so yeah, it was good to sort of get out and do some stuff. So yeah, no, my That's weekend good. was okay, but mm. now I'm just a bit tired and you know getting ready for the week ahead. So fun times, yeah. yeah? Yeah. Totally, totally, totally. We should get stuck into this anyway. I'll tell you what, we've got a really cool guest coming on today. So mm-hmm. I might get my main man up on stage today. So we've got joined Roland Arvinson. I hope I pronounced it correct. Roland, my main man, what's going on, brother? Spot on. It's yeah, all happening. Nice, <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice, nice. What's going I, I on? Just- uh, I just realized that I've uh, you, you guys have these yeah. great little titles going on and I've just got Roland. So yeah. uh, <laughs> Asperger syndrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah so Asperger syndrome, yeah. yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> see like the thing is, see like the thing is and like this only the people who can like watch our videos would see that type of thing. So this does go out like as a podcast as well. So for like people who might be listening on the podcast, we have our titles up on the screen. And I think the biggest thing for that is say for when people may not have even watched the podcast before, they know one who we are and that what we talk about is legit because we are legit, if that makes sense, yeah, you know what absolutely. I mean? Yeah, mm. you know. But Roland, man, thank you so much for coming on. Um, actually, oh, it's we, an we, honor. You know, um, actually, we've got, I've got to say hello to Martin because Martin always hey, Martin. jumps on. So, Martin, how are you, my man? Thank you so much for jumping on all the way from the sunny UK. Um, awesome stuff. But Roland, um, thanks so much for coming on. I, I gotta say, so Roland and I first met G Man was few what a few years ago now or a year Probably. ago. I can't remember. About two years ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because I think it was sort of like just after the pandemic. And that sounds right, yeah. Yeah. So um Roland actually was running, so there was like a, a meetup mental health group in Sydney here, and Roland actually used to, to to run the group type of thing. And um I sort of met him through there and we've sort of connected and you know, it, it's been really great to connect, but you know, I've been saying to him for ages, I'm like, dude, we got to get you on the podcast. You know, for one, you're neurodivergent yourself. You you do so much great uh, work in the mental health space. So it's like, man, we need this dude on here. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> Will, absolutely. And it's such an honor, <laughs> it's, it's such an honor to be here, man. Yeah. It's, awesome, it's man. such an honor to be here. Awesome, awesome, For real. Awesome. I, I love the work you do, Will, and it's just, you know, I'm, I'm stoked that uh, they, you consider me worthy, you know what I'm saying? Look, man, like, you know, I have a lot of people say that to me, but I think I'm only as good as the people I surround myself around, you know what I mean? I do great work, but the people I surround myself do as good, if not better work, which sort of reflects onto me type of thing and helps me drive to what I'm doing. So, no, thank you, man. But I tell you what, we should get stuck into this. So, you know, when we, when we first reached out, I said, man, what's a, what's a topic you want to talk about? And you said to me, how about this? And I hope I pronounce all this correctly.
correct. So today what we're going to be covering is peer support, a new paradigm for mental health recovery. Am I correct? That's spot on, man. Nice, nice, nice. So let's get stuck into this. Um, But before we do anything, I'll just do our normal sort of shout out. So if you haven't already done so, you might be a new listener. Please subscribe, like, and follow to all of our social media platforms. You can check us out on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, X, which used to be Twitter. Um, What's that other? What's that one there? Twitch, Twitch. Twitch. Twitch, um, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And if you haven't already done so, please go to our website at openheartedsociety.com and please subscribe, check out our blogs, and please check out any past um, podcasts that you may have missed. So let's get this show on the road. So you're the main man, Roland. You know, please tell – I obviously know a lot about who you are, but please let our listeners know a little bit about yourself, you know, um, you said you were neurodivergent before. Please share us a little bit about that and then we'll go on from there. Absolutely. Well, um, I've, I have uh, a diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome and I'm kind of high functioning. But for me, uh, while that's come with its challenges, uh, it's always been something that in my line of work, uh, when I was working in editorial, it was a bit of a superpower because – the synesthesia that comes with that enabled me to kind of uh, see optically where there was um, punctuation and stuff missing on a page or there were things wrong with uh, spelling and stuff, just like I feel it just by looking at it before I even read it. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, But, um, yeah, so I I spent about 20 years working in editorial and got – burnt out repeatedly uh, before finally waking up to the fact that maybe this isn't the best, uh, the best thing to do. And I've moved into the community sector now um, and I'm now doing mental health peer support and also social support, really loving it. I do still do a little bit of editorial stuff on the side, uh, but I'm not kind of chained to that as my, as my main source of income. And yeah, identify as uh you know with with asperger syndrome so i'm firmly on the spectrum but you know loving it rocking it and um you know just trying to trying to be the best version of myself i guess oh yeah nice man so when did you say you were diagnosed with a sp- uh, well autism or spurgis however you want to put it um the formal diagnosis came through in 2018 but like it was pretty obvious. Um, I I made friends with someone who was diagnosed uh, Asperger's um, in about 2010, and so when I was like, you know, we speak each other's language, the penny dropped that you know this is this is what's going on. Um, so I've sort of known, but the formal diagnosis was yeah was was 2018. And how great is how great is that moment? I had a similar experience, knowing that I was autistic for years, really beforehand. But um, the the confirmation in the end is is kind of nice. It is, yeah, and and I think there's there's a lot of validation in that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I was just like, yep, yeah, cool. I'm not crazy. I'm- <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. But you know, like I, I think this is the thing that like. And you said, you know, you connected with other people and it's like you were speaking that language type of thing, type of stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, especially when I was growing up, um, I, w- I, I would say I was pretty good at meeting people and creating conversation and stuff like that. That was quite a good strength of mine. But I never seemed to have that real good connection with most people. Like, it seemed like... I would connect with when I look at it now, people might have said like the um, the square pegs, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and now it's sort of like, oh my God, I have found my my crew. you know I, it's just so funny how, how 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 it all works. I don't know why. I don't know why. do you know what I mean? It was almost like we've said this before on the podcast, Kevin and I, 
um, when we met, you know, we just hit it off, you know, and I, it probably took a little while, but it wasn't weird or anything. I don't think Kevin and no, I don't know. no. do you know we, what I mean? And we were I mean, with lots of different people. I don't want to put it in negative language, but my my thinking was, oh, there's another video. We can, we we can be friends. <laughs> <laughs> Space, space, space. Yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. But man, like like you said, you you had got you had done a lot of stuff in editorial, and um, you know you said that that was burning you out. How how was that burning you out? Out of curiosity, if you don't mind sharing. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, because I'm a perfectionist, and um, so bless them. The people that I used to work with really did do their best to kind of. Um, to help me not micromanage myself so much. But at the end of the day, it was, um, I was putting in way more work than I really needed to be. And, you know, getting, getting stuff way more right than it really needed to be in order to, you know, for the ship to sail. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, like ultimately I, decided to kind of part ways with the the last um the last kind of close to full-time gig that i had um it was actually a really interesting uh really interesting assignment i was working on a um on a medical magazine Mm -hmm. and great crew really really um awesome people awesome team but again like i was you know there's there's a, a functional level of kind of well, not cutting corners, but there's a level when it's good enough. But for me, it was never good enough. So I'm, I'm and plus with COVID, you know, I had the uh, the luxury or the nightmare of working from home. So I'd be up at seven o'clock in the morning, just getting getting those neat, picky little details right that really made a difference to no one but myself. You know, so so it was like you were working even harder because you didn't have people around you to stop you from doing that. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. yeah, crazy. It's 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 funny how it can work like that. And also too how and I'm not saying that your workplace would do this, but pe- how people could potentially take advantage of someone like yourself in those situations, if that makes sense. Oh, absolutely. And again, not, uh, no reflection on, uh, on the place where I was working because I feel like they were great, you know, Mm. but there, there have been other places I've worked where absolutely there's, you know, um, it was a case of like the, the folder of steaming shit gets passed around to everyone and ultimately it lands on my desk and I'm the dude that deals with it because like, I'm the only dude who will go, okay, look. You're there, my man. No one. Sorry. Uh, yeah. We've lost him, but uh, um, you know, you're there. yeah, yeah. You're back down, yeah. my man. Yeah. You're okay, back. cool. Yeah. Sweet, cool. So you're talking about it would get to you type of thing. And I'm assuming that, you would be like, oh, my God, I cannot pass this on because it's not right. Well, you know, I, I'm the only dude who was prepared to actually do something about it, you know, mm-hmm. instead of pass it on to the next dude. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, it ended up and, – and, um, but again, look, I, I don't want to throw down on former employers or anything like that. So, And, and I will own that I, I could have – exercise my, my boundaries a little bit better, but mm. I've always been crap at boundaries and I'm I'm just starting to I'm just starting to learn that now and, and become better. So would you would you say would you say right like you, you said you, you've always been crap at boundaries, right? But since your diagnosis, have you sort of now looked at it and gone, oh my God, now because of this, this is why I'm struggling with this, is if that makes sense? Um, it, I wouldn't say that it's directly uh, through my diagnosis. Uh, it's more my uh, the psychologist I work with, um, and I am going to name and shame her, Rose Evans, because she is absolutely so talented. Mm-hmm. Um, she she is really she's helped me so much, mm-hmm. and um, boundaries is one of the um, one of the subjects where she put me onto a book about boundaries and I read it and I was like, <gasps> and again, suddenly the penny dropped and I'm like, I realized all this stuff that I've been doing 
well, when I say I've been doing wrong, I mean that um, I was I was not communicating well. I was mm. um, taking stuff on that I really didn't need to take on, and and mm. sometimes people would, um, you know, see an opportunity to. Um, sometimes people would see an opportunity to burden me with stuff that. I would do that they didn't have to. Mm, and other yeah. times, like sometimes dudes are just really pushy mm, and yeah. so you got to push back. And I'm like, I just didn't have the tools to do that. Right. Mm, yeah. So, and so I don't think it's exactly directly related to my diagnosis, mm. but just more my personality, I guess I'm, mm. I'm a sort of chronic helper. <laughs> See, I, I, I suppose the reason why I shared that is, is that, I know when I got diagnosed with ADHD was it was a lot of aha moments. Like, oh, yes. oh man, now I know why I'm stressed out when I'm going to this or now I know why I feel like this when I'm around this many people or, or now I know why I struggled with so much addiction and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? And I think that was Absolutely. where I was sort of like, oh, my God, now I can see why. And that's so useful, and I think it's it's really really great when, um, when for example, a diagnosis can provide you with that kind of information, and mm-hmm. then it it opens the door to so many resources that you can access that, like, just might not have occurred to you before. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, yeah. yeah, and you know, the way I look at it, it's it's always about uh, about learning and growing and kind of and becoming better and and. Um, like being again coming back to being the best version of ourselves that we can be totally uh, you know the, the the resources side of thing for me it wasn't like i was learning much new about the way that i behave it was more the diagnosis allowed me to understand that there was something attached to that and i guess understand mm-hmm. the root cause a little more but the resources after the diagnosis is what really helped me like you say like finding a good psychologist and, and being able to work through things and understand some things a little bit better that I wasn't doing so well understanding myself. Um, I, I found that's why I'm always a big proponent of, of diagnosis for people, even when they're sort of like, Oh, you know, it won't change anything. I'm like, Oh, it will, you know, you, you probably should go for it. Just out of curiosity. Oh, sorry. Just before we move on, we did have Gemma uh, message through here. Um, she said, great interview so far. Can you give me the name of the boundaries book? please is that something you're able to yep, give I'll, out? I'll have to um i'll have to look it up uh Gemma, if you uh if you ping me on linkedin I'll, like i'll I, I can't remember it off the top of my head it's a really good book i've got it on my kindle and i'll um i'll forward you the the title of the, uh, the author okay well what you will be able to do if you jump on to this uh like I'm talking to Roland. <laughs> if you, if you, if when we're when we're done, you can just go into the LinkedIn uh, video, which will be up. You'll see that message there, and you can probably just um, put yeah, that link cool. into us. So that's all cool. Yeah. But moving on from what you've been talking about, you know, you said that you done all this work in editorial for such a long time. Now you're moving into the community space, especially around mental health, all that type of stuff. You know, please tell us a little bit about the work you're now doing and what, what so, made you get into that. So now I'm um, I'm dividing my time between, like, m- most of the stuff I do is mental health peer support and I also do a little bit of social support um, two days a week where um, I'll, I'll quickly tell you about the social support first because that's a simple one. Um, and that involves uh, working with a young man who has autism And I, you know, he and I work together in a sort of mentoring format where, like, um, I support him with learning, um, learning and and developing independence, um, using public transport by himself, uh, just general life skills, but also, you know, cool stuff like archery, high ropes courses, that kind of thing. So that's my two days a week. 
three days a week, I'm in mental health peer support. Uh, and what that is, is basically uh, it's a mental health uh, support role that's different to a clinical model where I used my lived experience of my own uh, challenges with, of mental health to kind of walk with people who are struggling with their mental health and um, try and offer them some strategies and tools and use a kind of a trauma-informed model to be able to have conversations with these people and um, and support them on their recovery journey as well. Yeah, cool. So, cool. Sorry, sorry, you were about to keep going? Oh, and, and I do that at uh, Bondi Park, which is a prevention and recovery centre. Mm-hmm. And really awesome gig. I'm so, so grateful to work there. I work mm-hmm. with a fantastic team. Was that uh, hard to get into? It was, yeah. Mm. Um, like I sent out probably 25 resumes, you know, um, because understandably everyone wants sort of experience as well. Mm-hmm. But um, like without, you know, I'm, I'm tempted to, to get a, a little bit hippie about it, but it was, I swear it was like, you know, the, the universe lined up the right role for me. And um, I'm, I'm glad that I didn't get the other things that I applied for because this one is just such a great fit for my personality mm. and for my, you know, like what I have to offer and what I want to, uh, what I want to get out of it and what I want to, how I want to develop. So um, Bondi Park, uh, just to really, really quickly explain, is a place where, um, people can go either if they are having trouble with their mental health, but hospital might not be kind of like hospital might be too much. They need a bit of support, but not as much as a hospitalization. Or if people have been in hospital and they're ready to sort of re-enter the community, um, park is a sort of like a bit of a soft landing where they can spend four weeks readjusting to kind of, you know, like to, to the real world um, before rejoining their community and, and kind of getting back into to the swing of life as we know it outside of hospital. And, you know, and I'm one of the mental health uh, peer workers who is there just supporting people and just being a presence uh, and being there for people to talk to if they want to talk. And yeah. Cool, cool, man, cool. So, so you know, we, we're we're starting to get into you know a lot more of what you're doing now. Why is peer support so important for our mental health, or you know, um, just in general? And if you could maybe just uh, define what we mean, what we're talking about by peer support as well. I think in peer support, like we can talk about peer support as a like distinct line of work. Or we can talk about peer support as just a general way of we help one another as peers because mm-hmm. there, there's so much overlap and you, you don't have to be a peer support worker to provide peer support to your peers. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's something everyone can do. Um, and just in general, I think the most important thing is uh, it's, it's really important for our mental health because it's, it's a kind of – it's a place of equality. It's a place where people can walk together along a recovery journey. It's a place where um, peer support is all about um, maybe I've had some experiences that have been difficult for me and I've recovered from them or I am recovering from them or I've, uh, I've learned some things that have helped me manage my mental health mm-hmm. and I can share those with you. But also, I want to learn from you what you're experiencing. I want to find out what you're going through and learning that and just sort of sitting with you in that space will enrich my life as well because, you know, I, I get to have the honor of hearing your story. And, I and you know, like if someone feels safe to share what they're going through with me, then that's, that's kind of like a huge responsibility, but also like an honor. And also um, it makes me feel good that someone trusts me and someone feels 
comfortable to be able to talk about that. And it really does help just, just sharing that story, just getting it out of your system is, is in and of itself hugely relieving. Yeah, mm. cool, cool. We've cool. just had um, Dr. Philip. Uh, how do you pronounce her last name there, Kev? I'm going to say Fa- Fabry. Okay, cool. I would apologize if we're not pronouncing yeah. that correctly. So she says, how do I help young people with autism further themselves after school in terms of getting themselves out there, looking for work opportunities when they are so afraid? I suppose, like, when we're thinking about... Um, peer support, all of that type of stuff, how could we, I suppose, help people in those regards as well? Um, I think um, starting starting with really like small manageable steps, um, figuring out what's, what's the least that you can do that is a meaningful improvement. Um, so just going, going for um, what, what does the person feel comfortable about? Like what's what's something that they can do? Like for example, um, perhaps someone might be really into going on a ferry. So then you join that person for a ferry trip, or maybe they want to go on the bus. You join them and you show them it's okay. It's not that confronting to tap on, get a seat, and then you can ride the bus to your destination. Mm-hmm. You can help that person. Uh, use Google Maps. You know these these are things that we can support people in in learning to develop their skills in, and just build on that a step at a time in manageable increments. Um, and it's really quite um, when when you tackle it in in those kind of like really gentle um, and and compassionate kind of empathetic steps, and really listen to what the person needs taking it a little bit at a time you make a hell of a lot of progress surprisingly fast just by con- being consistent and building on those little steps and I, I would say you know that that's also sort of tied in with boundaries um and and learning to understand what is reasonable and unreasonable of other people to request of you as an autistic person um, and, and, and don't see it as limitations, just see it as your your functional capability um, and not spending too much time trying to, again, square peg, round hole yourself. Um, find, find the opportunities that are right, find the people that are compassionate and, um, you know, don't, don't, um, don't unnecessarily burn yourself out. Yeah, a yeah. thousand percent. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. And sorry, before we go on to this next question as well, what is it like you know, when you first start with someone compared to, say, when you're maybe leaving type of thing? Because, you know, I've been in the city before and um, seen um, people who have people like yourself helping them to learn how to catch the ferry and, and stuff like that. Have you found it to be quite confronting at first or what was it like for you? Um, it can be, but like generally speaking um i think approaching uh, approaching any new peer support relationship or any new kind of interaction just from a place of um being open and a place of curiosity and wanting to support and just kind of like um really maintaining that lens of equality mm. it's it really sort of when you uh, when you make it really clear that you want to hear what the other person has to say and you really want to work with them, um, they will often open up and you can have a great conversation and build some great rapport really mm-hmm. easily because you know we're both coming at it from from the angle of we want to go from a place where we're having trouble, where we're being challenged to a place where things are more manageable. So- yeah, totally, totally. And, and you know, Martin just came through with this and he says it's remembering people and not projects. Oh, yeah. You know, do you know what I mean? You know what I mean? I thought that was a really good way to sort of, you know. And I think as well um, it's probably looking at 
uh, the type of situations you're going into. So, for example, you're not going to start off in busy peak hour um, to, do you know what I mean? Exactly. Mm. Yep. Spot yep. on. You know, and because it's just like, oh, my God, that, that's like throwing someone in the deep end type of thing, if that makes It's like trying to learn to drive, for example. You're not going to say, okay, roll in up. We're just in the middle of the city here. <laughs> Let's pull over and then you can start driving. Um, it's just a, something bad. Chuck you into happen. a Formula One circuit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Off you go, win the race for me, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, yep. You know, so, yeah, it's probably assessing those situations. So in saying that, would there be like, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, like risk risk management um, things that you really got to look at prior and stuff like that? Absolutely, yeah. Um with uh, with the guests that we work with um, in in the formal peer support setting, when we're talking about um, the people that I work with at Park, um, we do like it's we're pretty transparent about it, and we're working with uh, the Southeast Sydney Local Health District. So um, all the guests that we work with have case managers, um, and we the guests and us we we all have a conversation about what they want to get out of the program and we talk about what specific challenges and what specific risks uh, they might be facing. So it might be, um, you know, like hopefully it's nothing too damaging, but sometimes uh, people have a history of self-harm. Sometimes people have a history of eating disorders. Sometimes people have a history of um, like really, uh, really distressing auditory or visual hallucinations that we need to be aware of. Um, And so that's, that, that all gets kind of like, we, we talk about that um, prior to a person uh, joining us at Park, mm-hmm. and so the team is all across that, and we and we've got uh, strategies in place for for how best to deal with that. Mm-hmm. But it's important to remember that um, as peer staff, we're not clinical; we're not expected to kind of to give take advice. that clinical kind of role. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So we're we've we've got a clearly defined role as peer support workers, and the clinicians do their thing. You know, like we work together. Yeah, cool, cool, Does that cool. Make sense? Yeah, no, no, totally, totally, totally. Now, you know, and this might actually work in well. So, what are some of the examples of how peers can support each other? Um, it's this is a really great question because um, I'll, I'll give you a case study because it's all about um, when when you have a kind of uh, sort of a, a clinician and a and a client, there's there's like this really distinct kind of power gradient going on. And like, not that there's anything wrong with that, but there's very much like one person is giving help and one person is receiving help. Um, whereas in the peer support paradigm, it really is very much about you're working together on something. Mm-hmm. And um, to give you a case study of what that can look like, um, for example, if um, if I'm talking to someone who is keen to work on their fitness, so we'll talk about, hey, you know, I'm going to ask this person to make a commitment to go to the gym and I'm going to say, hey, you know, it's funny that, but I could really do with getting back into exercise as well. So how about we do this? We'll agree that you're going to go to the gym and I'm going to do these exercises on my side and we'll meet up and we'll compare notes and we'll talk about how that went for each of us, you know? So that's, that's like one example of a, it's, and it is a bit simplistic, but it's a a case study of an example of how we each bring something real to the, to the relationship. Yeah. Yeah, totally, 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 totally. Um, sorry, Kev, did you want to say something on that? No, just that uh, uh, the, I guess it's the missing link in a lot of people who come to diagnosis or, or, or um, need to move forward with their life. I think, you know, I, I personally, I was missing the psych, psychologist, the psychologist side of things, and that was what I needed. 
But mm. I knew that what got me through before that was realizing that I was neurodivergent and building friends who were also as well. And then that's where the, the peer support side of things came in. But um, uh, I, I, I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, Roland, but you, you, you tend to come in when, when they've been sort of really lacking in that peer support side of things and really need to build those kinds of relationships. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that's how I try to try to yeah. help out. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. You know, it's super, and, super important. And, and and you know what, right? Like sometimes would you even say that people who have gone through something similar can be the best people to support these people, if that makes sense? So when I say that, it's like I remember there was a guy who I was, um, he was one of my students years ago, and he had had huge big drug problems, Right. And, you know, we're trying to, and he was an awesome dude, right? And I said, man, you'd be fantastic in like working in community and working around people like that because he just seemed to connect really well with everyone. And I think a lot of people who are coming out of, you know, drug abuse would be, he'd be able to relate to them on so many levels. Do you find that similar within the work you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's kind of the cornerstone of of the lived experience model, in that, um, you know, it's it's not as simple as saying, you know, this guest uh, lives with a diagnosis of bipolar, so they're, we're going to match them with a, a peer support worker who has bipolar. But it's yeah. kind of like there there is a lot of overlap, but it's definitely a case of. Um, we, um, as peer support workers, we all have an experience of actually going through that recovery journey and mm. being able to share what's worked for us mm. and to be able to kind of use um, use our, our own story as like, I suppose, to provide hope as mm. well. Um, yeah. And also to, to talk about and, you know, and to have those conversations around, um, you know, like, what are you experiencing? What's it like for you? This was what it was like for me. This is something that you can look forward to. Or for example, like um, sometimes people will be uh, really, um, and I'm going to say it in as many words, scared around medication. Um, And, you know, like, for me, medication has worked really well. I'm I not, temper not that. For yeah, I, I temper that with saying that like <clears throat> different things are right for different people, and mm. I, I I would absolutely not sort of go. This is a, a blanket policy, but um, used correctly, I think it can be really useful. Mm. Um, but so, for example, if if someone is having a, a really tough time wanting to try that you know i might be able to say hey look i've been on that medication and yeah it's got side effects but i feel that the benefits outweighed the side effects for me Mm -hmm. do you want to give that a go you know Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. yeah because i suppose everyone's i suppose situation is different isn't it absolutely something that worked for you may work differently for me Absolutely. And, got- and it's not about trying to persuade people or mm. it's not about trying to coerce, but it's mm. it's also about just sharing that, you know, this was my experience and make of that what you will. Yeah. And you've already kind of started to answer the next question we were going to ask because, you know, you were saying you do, they don't necessarily um, – attach a bipolar worker to a bipolar person but what 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 is the best approach i know for myself knowing will has been great for me and i I hope vice versa because we're not the same but we are you know we're we're both neurodivergent in different ways but um, we've experienced a lot of the same things through that um so i guess what is the best way to approach supporting your peers if you've got different lived experiences how would you advise people to go about that i think the most important thing is to like Um, approach from a place of openness, a a sort of spirit of curiosity. Um, Ultimately, um, we're all working from the intention of wanting to make things better. Mm. Um, And so, like, just being being real, being sincere, 
and accepting that, you know, we're not going to always get it right. And this, yeah. this routinely happens in, in, in my line of work that, you know, um, for want of a better expression, I'll put my foot in my mouth and I'll realize that I've, I've said something that causes me to disconnect with, with the person that I'm talking to. Um, or I've, I've inadvertently triggered someone, you know, because look, let's face it, they're having a difficult time and I'm doing my best, but you know, I'm, I'm not telepathic. Um, so the important thing then to do is to own that and to say, look, I'm really sorry. I, I didn't mean to cause you distress. How can we reconnect? What can we do to, to, to mend that rapport that was going really well? And let's talk about this and to just really foster that, um, foster that spirit of wanting to communicate and wanting to be equal and wanting to learn together. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm. So I think it's, it's all about, it's all about sharing, you know, um, the, the best approach is one of openness and of, uh, and of being real and of being genuine and sharing, I think. Yeah. Cool. 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 So, you know, Talking about that, so how can we encourage a culture of peer support in society then? You know, what 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 could can workplaces get behind this? Um, you know, how can we see more of this to be because I think the hardest thing, especially when someone's going through something, um, you know, it's very hard to just tell by just looking at someone. You know, could this, could peer support be some way of being able to, you know, be on more of a broader spectrum? I don't know. Mm, absolutely. Um, I think um, generally speaking, uh, one one thing, it's, it's a bit of a can of worms, but um, probably to really validate the, the, effectiveness of the peer support model um, through, um, <laughs> to be blunt, paying peer support workers a little bit better. Okay. Um, but then, but having said that, you know, nurses have been getting paid crap since yeah. time immemorial. So when the funds <laughs> come through, like I reckon nurses need to get the coin first. And once yeah. they're sorted, then the peer support workers can be next in line. You know what I mean? Oh, what, 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 a, what a surprise. Mental health workers are not getting paid enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's the thing, but you know, like it's, it's kind of, it's ironic and it's tragic that, and again, I, I straight away add the caveat that I'm not throwing down on psychiatry as an industry and I'm not throwing down on individual psychologists, but like I swear there are some dicks out there and you know, like I, I routinely hear horror stories about like actual case studies of um, a, a person has had an interaction with a, someone who's getting paid 600 bucks an hour. Right. Um, and this person is just being a smart ass and abusing the, the patient because who's going to, who's going to oh. believe in that case? Oh. You know, who's going to believe a schizophrenic? Yeah. Like that, that is for real what happens and it get, can, and it can get medieval. Can, like can I, can I say something on that? And you've actually raised something. Um, I was talking about this with someone the other day and it is so true. Some of these people who, and, and like we said, it's not all, but um, Absolutely. I know someone who is dealing with a psychologist um, still is at the moment. And that person was telling me, they're like, and I don't think they even listen to what I'm actually uh, saying. They know I'm just going yeah. in to get my script, um, you know, and this is the crap thing that you've got to go to a psychiatrist to get certain scripts because a doctor yeah. won't write them for you sometimes. Um, and, you know, there's been times where this person said, the person was talking to me about something completely different to what we mm -hmm had spoken about in the past. I think they thought I was a completely different patient. Do you know what well, I mean? Yeah, I've, I've experienced similar things personally with a psychologist. When I realized, started to realize that I was in serious distress mental health-wise mm -hmm. and it was likely linked to my autism, although it wasn't diagnosed yet, 
Um, I just went to psychologist after psychologist trying to find a good one. But every time I was in there, I felt like they went, oh, I heard keyword X. Let's give exercise number nine. Uh, here's a new way to breathe. And I was like, if you teach me one more breathing exercise, I swear I'm going to go crazy. I needed to I needed to get into what was going on with me and get you know uh, some, some proper help and dig into things. Maybe it's like, well, probably definitely a psychologist wasn't necessarily the person to do that. But... Um, yeah, you can feel a bit that way sometimes. You can feel a bit like a number, and it's especially hard when you're feeling distressed, when you're feeling like you really need need some help. Well, I suppose you're probably going there because you're like, okay, this person's potentially going to help me and mm. fix fix whatever it is I'm going to them for. Um, mm. So you put a lot of trust in these people, and yeah. sometimes these and these are everyday normal people as well. For all we know, they hate their job and they know that they're going to get paid <laughs> six hundred bucks um, for this one person. Let's get them in, get them out as fast as possible, type of thing, yeah. um, to make that money. Who knows? But, but again, but again, let's let's make clear that we say you know we've all had good psychologists and psychiatrists. This is just yeah, 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 um, totally. yeah. Some people no, we don't want to you know. Yeah, it's know. the same with it with it. In every industry, you know, like you, you get a few assholes that kind of ruin it for everyone. Um, and I really, really want to emphasize that that's absolutely not like the, um, that's the not normal. the fault, right? Yeah. yeah. And you, you would never want to discourage someone from going to seek help. Yeah, right? totally. You don't want to do and, that. And I will be the first to say, like, my, the psychologist that I work with at the moment is just, an absolute star and the yeah. last psychologist that i uh that i worked with also just brilliant you know really made me feel heard really provided me with really functional useful assistance and mm. that's you know that's the gold standard for me um so it's like if if you i, I suppose a really important message to get out there is if you do have the misfortune to come across a loser in the industry, mm -hmm. persevere because there are great ones out there. For real, mm -hmm. there are great ones out there. Totally. Which leads nicely into the, nice que into the next yeah, question. Yeah, totally. So what are some good things you see happening already? Um, one of the greatest things that I see is that like decision makers are really starting to take peer support seriously mm -hmm. and where uh, there's a lot of investment that is actually taking place in peer support. Um, so one of the places I, well, the place I'm volunteering in is called uh, Safe Space Inner West. And that's like a drop-in center for people who are experiencing su suicidal ideation and mental distress. Um, and it operates on a Friday and Saturday evening, and that's um, that's run with assistance from uh, from a, an organisation called Roses in the Ocean, which is uh, which is all around suicide prevention. And like, there's a lot of money that's being invested in this sort of thing, and I think that's a really really great thing. And I think, um, like, I, I went to a a conference in March that was all about, it was called the lived experience of suicide summit. Absolutely brilliant event. So awesome. And really like I'm really seeing change for the better taking place. Um, and I think that that's, that's the sort of thing that we need to foster and we need to encourage and yeah, continue throwing money at it because it is going to be spent well. Yeah. I really don't think that, um, uh, without getting too dark, I don't think that suicidal ideation among neurodivergent people is um, understood or talked about enough. I think mm. it's um, it's um, a little shocking to find out how prevalent it is. You know, when you, which I, I, personally I can kind of understand, growing up and living in a world that wasn't quite built for you. I imagine that could be yeah. quite frustrating and uh, yeah, it can be so isolating. Yeah, for real. Mm. Mm. Totally, totally, totally. So what are some things we need to change to encourage more peer support? You know, we've spoken about money and, you know, all that, but what, what could be some things we could change, you know? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think one, one of the really good things, like, actually is uh, things like exactly what we're doing right now, this podcast, mm -hmm. Um, to get the word out, you know, to, to get the conversation started, to, to start breaking down some of that stigma, because it's, um, it's really risky. It's dangerous to say, for example, like, 
um, I recently uh, put out, well, recently, about a month ago, um, I made a post on LinkedIn about um, where I talked about my mental health journey a little bit. Mm. Um, And it was pretty scary to do that because, you know, being real about I was in hospital, you know, that's full Mm. on. Um, And people really kind of get frightened by that and rightly so it's a big deal you know it's it's if you're in hospital for anything it's a big deal right Mm, totally um but the thing is i think it's so important to start breaking down that stigma and we need to start having these conversations and we need to really make it clear that it's important to talk about mental health Mm. um and i think the more that we um the more that we kind of are open and the the more that we become comfortable with having discussions around, um, you know, for example, if you're like, if you're, un, if you're feeling so unwell that you can't come to work, that doesn't have to be because you ate something and you're puking. That can be because you're suffering the, suffering because you're experiencing anxiety right and we shouldn't yeah. make people feel bad because of that either exactly yeah, yeah. that um I, I think and and there is a growing legitimization of that and i think that's really really cool um but i think that that's that's the sort of thing that we really need to keep working on and we really need to keep emphasizing is that um the importance of bringing mental health out into the open and talking about it and making it okay to accept that, you know, we're all human beings and we all have these challenges, some of us to a greater extent than others. Um, and we need to manage it and we need to work together because, you know, like mm. I, I know it's a bit sort of tree hugging and hippie, but I'm, I, I am an optimist and I, and I do really want things to continue improving and I think that there's really great, uh, great changes taking place, mm. and really great stuff going on. And I, and my hopes are very high for the future. Yeah. And, I, so, I, I, I long before my business life, I used to manage teams a lot for different companies and stuff. And you would get the common stuff like, oh, I've got gastro, I've got food poisoning, and you would get these over and over again. And I started to see a pattern, and I was like what's going on here? And I started to realize after paying attention and having conversations with the employees, they were all having mental health issues and they didn't feel comfortable saying that that was a good enough reason. And then when I would speak to my boss, I would discover that they didn't consider it a good enough reason to, to have a day off. Oh, I'm a bit depressed. Wow. Like, oh, you know, so it, it does. See, need- but I remember when I was younger, if you would ring up and say, look, I'm just not feeling up to it today. Mm. You know, they would be, it just wasn't spoken about enough. You get, you you get, you get disciplined. Well, yeah, I just think people just, and I think this goes back to what you were saying, Roland, like, you know, I think we're now at a point where mental health, for example, put me, is definitely getting more recognition than what it was because we are talking about it more. People are embracing and going, yeah, speak up. It's okay to have, um, a down day or whatever like that type of thing and people are starting to go oh crap because you know like when I was younger right I definitely would have struggled with depression and anxiety but at that point in time I didn't know that that was that if that makes sense you know I remember days where I was like man I feel like crap and you know so I would just you know smoke weed or, or go and drink right, Uh, which obviously probably wasn't the best thing for it. Um, But it's okay, Kev, just having a beer in the afternoon. Do you know what I mean? It's it's okay. Like after this, my wife and I are probably going to sit down, have some cheese and have a few glasses of wine. You know what I mean? There's nothing wrong with that. It's controlled. We're not. It would be a problem. Well, it would be a problem. Well, it would be a problem if we had, I sat down, had a few things of, um, cheese and then had a few glasses of wine and then drove down to the shop drunk, brought a few more and kept on drinking and then went to, went to work. Do you know what I mean? That's when yeah. it's a problem. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but, um, and I think sometimes, you know, when you can uh, control it like that, it can be effective. But, um, yeah, so little things like that. Now that we're speaking about it more, um, and I think this goes with a lot of topics as well. There's been a lot of other topics I've been jumping on recently, um, you know, in regards to um, other topics around sort of addiction and stuff like that. That's definitely um, important to talk about. I don't know what's happened to Photon John there. Are you there, Kev? Don't know what's happened to him. But anyway, we'll, we'll keep on, we'll keep on mo- motoring along there. But, look, to tell you the truth, that we're, we're sort of getting towards the um, end here anyway. That's cool. um, like you were saying, um, uh, you were going to get that um, stuff for um, – in regards to that boundaries book, and you'll be able to um, share that on the in the comments a bit later. But you know, if people want to connect with you, maybe find out a little bit more about the work you're doing. Um, what would be the best thing for them to do for you, or where would they be able to connect with you? What's the best What's the best journey? Uh, look me up on LinkedIn. Um, the other thing is that I'm starting to put together a um, like. This is only a twinkle in my eye. Hey, Photon hey, dropped back. Hey, he's back. What happened to you, brother? I think my Wi-Fi dropped out. I'm not, I oh, okay. Fair enough. All good, man. We were like, what's he doing? Was he maybe <laughs> got sick of it or something? Yeah. Nice. All yeah. good, man. All good. Sorry, we're just winding things up because we're getting to okay. the end here. Sorry, did you have anything else you wanted to go on um, uh, with anything, uh, Kev, before we start no, winding it up? Well, I did just want to say, um, you know, I've just moved to a, a place north of Brisbane where I did live and lived a very busy life. I have a band and play a lot of gigs and uh, have a lot of friends and stuff and um, uh, manage, have to manage that carefully between alone time and, and friend time. And then I moved north and I don't really have that problem anymore because I'm very isolated up here <laughs> and I found it very difficult. And there was an organization here um, that does uh, uh, more of a friend-based version of, of what you're talking about. You, what you do is... is a bit more serious, I think, but um, really just seeing that and hearing you talk, I really got to say how much I admire that there are people like yourself out there doing doing what you do. It's it's pretty amazing. Thanks. It, 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 takes, it takes a lot of dedication and a lot of compassion. Thanks. See, that, that means a lot, man. Thank you. And that's what I mean, man. Like you came on in the beginning and you're like, oh, Will, it's so, I'm so inspired by the work you're doing, man. We're inspired by people like you. Do you know what I mean? Like we can't do all this great work without people like yourself and everyone else out there doing awesome work. So no, it's it's a credit to you, mate. And the amount of people we meet, we meet like yourself, and uh, you know, just through this podcast, it's not just about. I mean, it is about the conversation, but it's, but it's definitely not about ourselves. It's just like where we already knew that conversations needed to happen more in public and more openly, but the people we're meeting through the podcast, like yourself, is blowing our minds there's a lot of good people out there doing good things for real and and that's the way to go you know we we all work together we support one another and we inspire one another get the message out share and share alike you know so yeah um and the the only other thing that i was going to say is like it's it's only a twinkle in my eye (laughs) at this point but um i'm putting together a uh like a, an independent peer support uh, service, and that's going to be under the heading of Fractal Heart. Mm-hmm. So I'll um, I'll pop that in the comments. But um, I've only is got this a like very... a business or something you're trying yep. to start? Yeah, 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 cool, man, cool, it's, cool. It's cool. only a very very rudimentary holding page right now, but it's got mm-hmm. my email address there. Um, honestly, the simplest way is LinkedIn. But mm-hmm. if you go fractalheart.com.au You'll find right a holding page there, right? Yeah. yeah, cool, cool, cool. Oh, that's really cool. Will you have uh, more people be able to connect through the NDIS through you or anything like that's that? That's right, or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. Oh, let me know if you need any help with setting some some stuff up, man. Um, Sensational, will do. And it could even be cool. One, do you have like a logo or anything like that ready yet? Not quite. Okay, cool. Maybe. <laughs> okay, it's, it's obviously early days, but when you do, let us know and we'll pop it up on the um, Open Hearted Society um, website page. That'd be amazing, man. Really appreciate uh, I, it. 
I also know many, many graphic designers if you need help. Sweet. Oh, look, I <laughs> might take you up on that for real. Cool. There you go. There you go. Awesome. Cool, my man. Well, look, Roland, it's been such a pleasure having you on. You're looking well, my man. Um, Thank you it's so been, much. It's been amazing. Yeah, it's been good just sitting down and chatting and, and hearing about all – because I haven't really spoken to you full on like in, in about a year, I suppose. Yeah. Hey, you know, while, time, time flies when you're having fun, my man. It does. It you certainly know? does. But, Roland, thank you so much for coming on. And, look, for, for anyone who's listening, please um, connect with Roland on his LinkedIn page. Um, uh, comment through on here. I'm sure we'll be able to connect you with him. Fred on John, did you have anything else you wanted to say before we close off? I just wanted to point out this uh, uh, to anyone who's watching on video, this beautiful Jesus light that's coming down on top of Roland. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. I didn't realize that. Good job, yeah. man. Yeah, Intelligence, yeah. yeah, for the win. <laughs> yeah, totally. No, it's been great. Thank you so much for coming on, Roland. I've, I've really awesome. enjoyed the chat. Awesome. Oh, thank awesome. you. Thank you. It's yeah. been great. I really no appreciate problem. it. Thanks no so problem. much, folks. Take care. And for everyone listening, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe, like, and follow to all of our social media platforms. Check us out at our website, openheartedsociety.com. My name's Will Wheeler. Join with my main man, Photon John, and this is the Open Hearted Podcast. Till next time.